Welcome everyone. My name is Talia Rodriguez. And I'm Cami Junkie. And we are students in the Counseling and Guidance Program at California State University, San Bernardino. Come join us as we explore two articles related to adolescent substance use and then provide a call to action about some things we can do to better support adolescents in our schools and communities. Let's go. Today, we're here to talk with you guys about adolescents who struggle with substance use. First, what we're going to do is we're going to go over two articles that we read related to this issue, and then we're going to move on to a call to action about what we as a group think needs to change in schools and communities to better support our adolescents. The first article that's being talked about is the effect of victimization on drug use, a multi-level analysis by Lowe, Kim, and Church. Um, this article talks about any individual who experiences any harm or abuse is likely to cause some immediate harm or disturbance physically or emotionally to personal and social development. Such negative social relationships create stress that may be leading to crime and deviance. There are two types of co coping strategies stated in the article. The first is legitimate coping, which is if an individual experiences harm, they have better skills to face the problems they encounter day to day. If an individual does not have these skills or access to resources, they may turn to negative behaviors that can include substance use and criminal acts. Age plays a critical role in this experience to harm and drug use relationship. Developmental theories show that while one transitions from adolescence to adulthood, there is less exposure to negative environments, which is also a time of increasing maturity, which provides greater resources and enhanced problem solving. However, it's still critical to understand adolescents, they have weaker self-control combined with lower social control, as well as more exposure to delinquent peers, which raises the likelihood of engaging in crime and deviance. Perpetrators are commonly under the influence of drugs and more than likely have experienced harm at a younger age, which led them to engage in negative behaviors. This often creates a cycle of drug use and experiences of harm. So the second article we're going to talk about is called a multi-level analysis of the impact of neighborhood structural and social factors on adolescent substance use. This article is from 2015 and it was written by Fagan Wright and Pinchetsky. So basically what this article was looking at was how neighborhood context affects adolescent substance use. So basically how the neighborhoods we live in affect uh, whether or not adolescents are going to be using um, substances. The things that they looked at were structural and social factors um, that affected adolescent substance use. So what does that even mean? They looked at the structural, which was economic disadvantage, immigrant concentration and residential stability. Related to the social factors, they looked at whether or not people around there were willing to help their neighbors. Is there a kind of a community that's willing to help each other? Uh, are there, is there social network interaction? Is there intolerance of drug use? And how do people view, view the laws around drug use within the neighborhood? The final measurement was what does substance use qualify as in this study? And for them, it was any use of tobacco, alcohol or marijuana. So that's kind of the guidelines that they used in this study. And they drew this information from the Project on Human Development in Chicago neighborhoods. To complete this study, they did two wave of interviews. The first interview was from 1994 to 1997, and then they followed up with the same families and adolescents in the second wave, which was in 1997 to 2000. The results of this study were interesting. They found out that individual and peer factors stood out the most and were consistent predictors of substance abuse. So actually, adolescents' interactions with their friends was a pretty good predictor of whether or not they'd use substances. There was a greater likelihood of substance use reported by older and Caucasian adolescents. And ultimately, the study found that few neighborhood factors had statistically significant direct effects on adolescent use of tobacco, alcohol, or marijuana. So the conclusion that this study found was that they really need to do some more research about understanding the contextual influences on adolescent substance use because they need to know these things to be able to create more focused um, and effective substance use and abuse prevention programs to actually help kids. So from the narrative lens, which is something that we focus on in our program, 
This article helps us see that we need to consider the external factors and context that works on adolescents related to drug use, because we feel that the person is not the problem, the problem is the problem. Now we are asking you who are watching this video to consider joining us to take some steps to reduce and remove the systems of oppression that we feel contribute to the adolescent substance abuse problem. We are going to talk about this in schools and in the community. So first we're going to talk about schools. Since majority of adolescents go to school, we wanted to look at what schools are currently doing to help adolescents with, uh, who are using substances and also what can be improved on. So first we want to tell you about some examples of what lo some local schools are actually doing. Some local programs are youth outpatient programs at different locations and also school outpatient treatment. Um, a lot of these places offer sliding scale of fees and some of them are free for Medi-Cal Medi recipients. Another thing that schools in the area are doing is preventative and outreach. A lot of administration at the beginning of the year will talk with students about substance use. They'll also go over school policies and consequences for being under the influence. As well, they also have signs and posters about the dangers of vaping and they provide some after school programs um, for students. Uh, there's even the Boys and Girls Club that will come to recruit older students to work with younger, younger students and do some peer mentoring. Another thing that local schools and districts are doing is training with parents. They're training parents about what drugs have been seen on campus, what they actually look like, and what they, the parents need to look out for, because oftentimes parents don't know what's even being used on campus. So something to keep in mind is that the resources we just listed might vary from school and district, and it also might be different for private schools depending on funding. If you're a student or a parent watching this video, please feel free to contact the counselor at your school for more information about what kind of help is available. You guys can also contact administration at your school, your district office, or your local health care provider to see what's available. So with these resources in mind, as a group, we wanted to come up with some ideas about how to further support adolescents who struggle with substance abuse. The first thing we thought of was we wanna reduce the stigma of substance use. One way we can do this, like I mentioned, we use narrative therapy in our program, which is that we view the person is not the problem, the problem is the problem. So we feel that using externalizing language Separating the problem from the student and their identity can be really helpful for kids so they can have a real conversation about the effects of the substance they're using. We also think that um, removing the stigma can help students access resources without feeling like they have to get in trouble with school first to be able to access these resources, make them easily accessible and not stigmatized if a kid comes in the office to ask for help. Our other idea is to provide more resources on the school campus. We think schools are doing an okay job, but we also feel that more group counseling on campus could be helpful because from the first, the second article, peer-to-peer -peer, um, interactions play a huge role in substance use. So if they're in groups, they can support each other as peers. We also think it could be helpful to ed educate teachers about some of the systemic and contextual issues that kids experience day to day that might be affecting um, their school performance and make them more likely to use a substance. So if you are a current school counselor or educator watching this video, we invite you to join us in starting this conversation to get more of these resources at your school. We also want to look at the community side for better ways to support adolescents. One idea is early childhood interventions which teach coping skills at a young age so that adolescents do not refer to substances. Another one is positive parenting classes and communication skills. More programs available for teenagers to be involved in the communities as well as safe spaces for teenagers and adolescents to hang out. Better access to mental health services. And lastly, awareness of what resources are available to them. Whether you're a counselor, student, or just somebody who's watching the Radical Therapist YouTube videos, we would like you to consider taking action with one of the ideas that we gave and advocating to better help the adolescents in all of our communities. We'd like to thank you guys for taking time to watch this video. If you enjoyed it, please make sure to like it and subscribe to the Radical Therapist to be able to see other great videos from our classmates. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you for watching.